Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. When we left off last time, the English buccaneers led by Captain John Coxon had attacked the fort at Santa Maria. They'd taken the town and ransacked the mint there of all her raw, unsmelted gold. They'd also rescued the daughter of the king of the local Kuna people, King Golden Cap. She, along with a few other Kuna women and girls, had suffered terribly at the hands of the Spanish in the garrison. The daughter, at least, and likely several of the others as well, were pregnant where they hadn't been before. They were bruised and they were hungry, but they were still alive. The Kuna warriors, led by their leader, named Androeus, took the women under their care and led a group of those Spanish soldiers into the nearby jungle where they were massacred. Now the buccaneers found themselves embroiled in a bit of turmoil here. They were disturbed by the murder of the Spanish, at least that's what they wrote down. They wrote of their horror at seeing the Christian prisoners treated this way, and of their desire to stop the Kuna in their killing of the Spanish. After all, what could three hundred and fifty hardened killers armed with muskets and pistols and swords hope to do against maybe fifty Kuna warriors that were armed with lances? And probably they had a few muskets, but come on. If Captains Sharp and Coxon and Sawkins really had any desire to stop the Kuna, they absolutely could have. Now it's true they did have to preserve their alliance with the Kuna. If they stopped them, they might have to do so by force, and that wouldn't bode well for their relations with the natives of Darien. And they would eventually have to cross their lands again, which could prove treacherous if they made enemies of the Kuna. But no, I think the buccaneers saw what was being done to the Spanish not exactly as murder, more like justice. The English and the Spanish were old and bitter enemies, after all. It's not like they hesitated to kill each other whenever the opportunity presented itself. And they did actually save the lives of a few Spanish soldiers. There were maybe as many as a dozen Spanish officers who begged the mercy of the buccaneers and received it. The English claimed them as guides and hostages against their upcoming incursions into Spanish territory and preserved the lives of their prisoners. Now, these weren't important people, as these things were reckoned by the Spanish. They weren't generals or governors or priests, not the type of people you would typically want for a hostage. All the important people at Santa Maria had fled prior to the attack in ships that were filled with gold. The lowly soldiers were those who were left to die defending the walls of an empty fortress, but these men were probably the ranking officers who had left after the gentry fled. Now, our chroniclers can probably be forgiven for writing about their distaste at seeing so many Spanish men killed by the Kuna. It was undoubtedly actually pretty brutal. It was difficult to watch for anybody. This wasn't the heat of battle, which they were used to. It was a mass execution. And our chroniclers were, by and large, middle-class, landed English gentlemen. They hadn't been raised in the gutters of London or Dublin or amidst the rum sinks in Port Royal. They were different stock than most of the pirates. And we're actually getting to a point here where some of the buccaneers were almost certainly loyal Caribbean Port Royal boys. That English invasion of Jamaica was more than 25 years gone by now. There were plenty of prostitutes in Port Royal and sailors passing through to bear an entire generation of young men who had no prospects but were eager to win a fortune in a career of high seas adventure. Now, not our captains. Most of them were older men who were actually born before the invasion of Jamaica. They'd sailed for England in one or another of her wars and they'd turned to piracy when those wars ended. And the accounts of voyages like these tend to focus on the captains. We almost never get accounts of the day-to-day lives of rank-and-file pirates. But there were, what, 335 men on this voyage whose names are virtually unknown. And really it's their stories that I want to tell whenever possible. And today, well, today's story is small. It focuses on just a few men and the struggles they endured. Not battles or the spoils they won, but day-to-day hardships. We have this account thanks to one of our educated gentlemen, but for all his education, all of his Latin and mathematics and science, in this story today he was just a buccaneer. 
It reminds me, our story today, of movies like The Revenant. In scope, it's a very small story. There aren't any clashes between titans, but it does give us a snapshot of what life was actually like for all of the thousands of pirates whose names we will never remember. This is episode 41, Those Who Are Born to be Hanged. Massed within the fort, those buccaneers were in that state of turmoil. Among the assembled captains, that is, John Coxon, Bartholomew Sharp, Richard Sawkins, Peter Harris, and Edmund Cook, they were deliberating on exactly what to do with the Spanish prisoners they had under their protection. Now, this might cause strife between the Kuna and the buccaneers if they were to stick out their necks for even one Spanish life. But there was one life in particular that was the cause of the trouble. He was the man responsible for taking the king's daughter. He was probably the commander of a unit detached to the Kuna capital to see that the Kuna behaved themselves. Now, King Goldencap wanted his head in particular, but according to Basil Ringrose, he, quote, had promised to lead us not only into the town, but even to the very bedchamber door of the governor of Panama, and that we should take him by the hand and seize both him and the whole city before we should be discovered by the Spaniards, either before or after our arrival. And Panama was the goal. Whatever danger saving this Spaniard's life might have presented, the potential tactical value as a hostage was... Well, it simply outweighed the danger. So the captains deliberated on exactly what to do with this rapacious Spaniard and his companions. But under the surface, there was another, more dangerous sort of tension building. The men who were busy helping themselves to Spanish stores of wine and meat in the town, well, they were grumbling. Captain Coxon, the admiral of this here excursion, hadn't exactly proved his mettle in battle. All through their march across the isthmus, he'd whinged about the heat and the terrain. He was quick to suspect the Kuna of treachery, even after they'd proved themselves to be friends again and again. On the other hand, Captain Sharp had been ill when they landed on the main, but he marched through it. He toughed it out, he rode alongside his men, and he showed them exactly what he was made of. When battle came, he and Captain Cook had led the Forlorn into battle. They'd taken the fort and lost not a man. Now, Coxon, he'd stayed back from the battle. He'd urged caution. He'd suggested another plan, more delays. He'd been the last commander to march on Santa Maria. When it finally came time to draw swords, well, he'd proven himself a coward. So the men weren't happy with their commander. Over their glasses of Spanish wine and tables full of rich food, well, they grumbled. Some went even a little bit farther. They suggested that perhaps it was time to see Coxon replaced. Captain Sharp had proven himself, and Captain Sawkins had been pirating longer than any of them. He was the most experienced, and he had proven himself brave during the battle. In the end, though, cooler heads prevailed. Right now, it was best to see how things panned out. Things were tense between them and the Indians. They needed to stay strong and not risk any sort of fighting amongst themselves. If they showed weakness to the Kuna, they might just decide to up and march home. Now, as it turned out, the Kuna were actually planning to march home. King Goldencap had marched his own force on Santa Maria to see that his daughter was rescued safely, and right now they were preparing to leave. Their guides, though, the men who had led them across the Isthmus, led by that man, Androeus, were planning to stay with the buccaneers, but still no more than about twenty of them. The captains, though, finally came to a decision. They decided that they would spare the lives of their Spanish prisoners and carry them along to their next intended destination. That was the city of Panama. Panama had always been the target, after all. Santa Maria had merely been an opportunity. They found that they could secure the aid of their Kuna guides. They had the chance to rescue several young women and also to carry off whatever spoils they found in the town. And after all of the hospitality that they'd enjoyed at the Kuna City, it was the least they could do. 
So after Portobello and now Santa Maria, the pirates were amassing a respectable haul, but Panama, Panama was the jewel. It was a legendary prize. It was full of riches beyond imagining. It was the greatest storehouse of Spanish wealth in the New World. And they actually had a plan to harvest that wealth. Morgan had attacked from the land, which allowed the Spanish to sail away with their treasure. These pirates intended to attack Panama from the sea. They would cut off any escape by ship and take the city from her docks. Now, even if the locals had time to pack up their treasure and send it off by land, well, they had 350 men with Kuna guides. They could acquire horses in town and chase down the Spanish no matter how they travel. If they traveled by men or mule train or carriages, even if they had horses, those horses would be laden with gold and silver, while the pirates would travel light. This was a good plan. All of the captains voted on it and concurred. But they did have one problem. In order to take Panama by sea, well... They had to be on the sea. They'd left all of their ships on the coast of the North Sea on the other side of the Isthmus before marching overland. All they had now were a few canoes, and the Kuna were actually taking most of their canoes back home with them. This was a problem, but these were pirates. This wasn't insurmountable. These weren't just pirates. These were the best pirates operating in the world at the time. They had guns, and they had swords, and they had canoes. That was plenty to find and commandeer a few Spanish vessels. And then they found another boon. They'd found tied up at Santa Maria's river dock a periagua or piragua. That's a Spanish word derived from the old Carib that basically means dugout or big canoe. In actual terms, the definition of this craft has changed many times over the centuries, but when the buccaneers found this piragua and wrote about it, what they were talking about was a large, flat-bottomed, open-decked, single-masted boat, suitable for rowing or for sailing on either rivers or lakes or the open ocean. Now, it wasn't a ship. There were no guns and no holds. It was just a boat with a square-rigged sail and some oars. But she would be fast, and she would be quiet, and, well, she was versatile. It was just what they needed in this situation. So the Kuna guides organized crews among the Englishmen for hollowing out new canoes, and a select few, the best among them, were chosen to prepare and crew the piragua. The next morning, as the sun rose, the mass of the Kuna were preparing to depart, King Goldencap shared a few words with Androeus and the warriors accompanying him and the buccaneers, and then he approached the pirates. He gave them thanks, and he invited them to return to his lands whenever their errand was done. But he had one last request. The Spanish had committed great crimes from this fort at Santa Maria. They had subjugated his people, made war on them, and finally carried away their daughters to this place. King Golden Cap wanted it burned to the ground. Now the pirates had pillaged every scrap of gold and arms and ammunition and food that they could scrounge up, so they were happy to oblige. On the morning of April 10th, 1680, the fort at Santa Maria was engulfed in flames. The Kuna people rode north toward their home, and a force of 350 pirates, 20 or so Kuna guides, and maybe a dozen Spanish prisoners put into the river Darien, headed toward the southern sea. I mean, picture that. That's right out of a movie, right? I mean, imagine Tom Hardy, bearded and cold-eyed, Imagine him tying up his Spanish prisoner and looking down river at the canoe of the departing Kuna. The air between them is shimmering from the heat coming off of the burning fortress, and King Goldencap looks back at him, his hand on the shoulder of his pregnant daughter. She turns back and looks at the pirates one last time. Then, King and daughter turn around and row away. I mean, that's right out of Dances with Wolves or The Last of the Mohicans, right? Regardless, though, the English rode south toward what they called the Bay of St. George. Now, today, that's called the Gulf of San Miguel. On our website, I've added a few maps of this region of Panama. 
it might be helpful for you to take a look at those. Now, some of those are actually drawn by members of our pirate crew here today, but others will be modern topographical maps. And I'm going to label some of them with the route that our pirates took so you can understand where they're going, and I'll update it in the weeks to come as our story continues. But here is where our tale takes a sharp turn. Sharp and Dampier and Wafer, well, they all brush over this next bit, what is essentially the rest of today's story, with a single line in their accounts, at most. One of the three, Sharp, actually gives us the most description. He mentions stopping the first night, taking in water, seeing some gold in the river, and then sailing on to the South Sea. And that's it. He was probably in the Piragua, and he had an easy go of it. He does, in passing, mention that some of his men had troubles, but there is so, so much more to this story. Today we're going to follow the account of Basil Ringrose. And he wrote of the pirate's departure from Santa Maria, quote, we all embarked in thirty-five canoes and a periagua, which we had taken here lying at anchor before the town. Thus we sailed, or rather rode, down the river in a quest of the South Sea upon which Panama is seated. And he continues, Among these canoes it was my misfortune to have one that was very heavy and consequently sluggish. By this means we were left behind the rest a little way, there being only four men besides myself that were embarked therein. As the tide fell, it left several shoals of sand naked, and hence, we not knowing of the true channel amongst such a variety of streams, happened to steer within a shoal for above two miles before we perceived our error. Hereupon, we were forced to lay by until high water came, for to row in such heavy boats against the tide is totally impossible. End quote. So five men were all stuck in a sluggish canoe, and they got left behind. Now next time we'll go into the exploits of the pirates that made it to the South Sea in a timely manner, but I want to follow these men today. Now Ringrose doesn't say much about who his companions were, but we can infer at least one of them. It was that leader of the Spanish garrison at Santa Maria, that same man who'd so offended the Cuna and kidnapped King Goldencap's daughter. He was a prisoner in the custody of Basil Ringrose. Now, Ringrose spoke fluent Latin and French, as well as English, obviously, but on this journey he was to become acquainted with Spanish and acted as an interpreter. Now, we can assume that he knew a touch of Spanish, but that he began learning more and more of the language here in an effort to communicate with this Spaniard to glean whatever he could about Panama. If you take a look at those maps, and I still suggest that you do, you can see where the river widens, setting out from Santa Maria, and from there it starts to twist and turn like a serpent, and then it forks and it heads south, and then it forks again later and heads south again, this time with a much wider mouth, and then it heads north. It's going to be a confusing waterway. But none of those maps are detailed enough to show you everything. There are tiny islands, there are sandbars, and there are a multitude of creeks and streams branching off from the river. The buccaneers who went ahead were lucky enough to have Kuna guides with them, and they knew just what path to take. But Basil Ringrose and his companions weren't so lucky. As soon as those boats with Kuna guides were out of sight, this crew was hopelessly lost. And then the tide went out. They were moving so slowly that while the other men made it, they didn't. What was already a maze of inlets and coves and shifting sandbars was suddenly too shallow to row. It became impossible to navigate. They were forced to pick up their canoe and walk to shore where they could wait for the tide to come in. All the while, their companions were getting farther and farther away. After a time, though... The water returned. At last they could finally get their boat back in the water, but they were almost certainly off the correct path and they knew it. Regardless, they didn't have a choice. They had to row. Even if they were heading in the wrong direction, they would eventually have to reach the sea, right? Here's the thing. Ringrose didn't know it, but this leg of the river was headed north, towards the sea to the south. Can you imagine that feeling? All of the doubt 
the South Sea was to the south, but you were headed north. That's where the men before you had gone, but all day Ringrose must have felt that he was going in the wrong direction, thinking that they must have turned south at some point, but he didn't know where. Regardless, they chose to keep on. But after a day of rowing, nightfall came. They hadn't seen a sign of the other boats all day, but they were tired and they were sore and forced to pull the boat ashore. They stuck an oar in the sand and tied the boat up to her. They, quote, slept by turns in our canoe, several showers of rain falling all the night long, which pierced us to the skin, end quote. But when dawn came, they were once again off in their canoe. Perhaps, they thought, if they left early enough and made haste, they could catch up with the others. Imagine their relief and their chagrin when, no more than two leagues downriver, they came upon a small collection of Kuna huts and several canoes belonging to their friends. This was that same place where Captain Sharp had written of taking water and seeing gold glinting in the riverbed. Now, not all of the buccaneers were there, but those who were told Basil Ringrose and his companions of a good place to collect water nearby, where it was fresh and delicious. The Kuna insisted that this was the place to collect water, as there wouldn't be another good place to stop for some time. So Basil Ringrose and his companions went to collect some water. When they came back, all of the other pirates had already left. I mean, come on. They couldn't wait for just a little bit. It's like being the fat kid running the mile back in elementary school. All of your friends just go on ahead. But at least they knew, beyond a doubt now, that they were headed in the right direction. Their canoe may have been terrible, but it would get them there eventually. And they weren't, they now knew, that far behind. Ringrose wrote of their departure, quote, Such is the procedure of these wild men that they care not in the least whom they lose of their company or leave behind. End quote. It's like that line from Pirates of the Caribbean. What code is Gibbs to keep to if the worst should happen? Pirate's code. Any man who falls behind is left behind. So they got back in the boat and they rowed hard to try and catch up, but it was all in vain. Near the mouth of the river leading into the bay, they were accosted by dozens and dozens of islands. Some were smaller, some were larger, but all of them were blocking the view and created an untold number of tiny waterways between them. Ringrose and his fellows rode around for several hours among these islands, trying to find the channel that would carry them to freedom, but again and again they were turned around. Sometimes they were headed back the way they'd come. Other times they found themselves at a dead end of what had seemed like a promising waterway. Once again, they'd spent an entire day rowing in circles while the entire company of pirates left them behind. At last, when the sun was creeping down towards the horizon, they found the right path. They saw the mouth of the river and the Gulf of San Miguel. It was right there in front of them. And they couldn't reach it. The water from the gulf was flowing so forcefully toward them that even though the gulf was less than a stone's throw away, they couldn't throw their undermanned and ungainly canoe into it. They struggled and they struggled against the current, but finally they were forced to give in. They let the current carry them back toward the islands that had so vexed them all day. They tied the canoe to a tree on that nearby island and waited for the tide to turn. But they didn't have even a moment to rest. That water that was rushing in, it was what they called the young flood. Well, it was bashing their canoe in a broadside. It was rocking it back and forth so forcefully that a steady flow of water was flooding into the boat, threatening to sink her in four fathoms deep water. For two hours, Ringrose and his men filled buckets with water and dumped them from the boat. They were bending and heaving and bending and heaving. All of this after a long day of rowing and then after a fierce struggle against an unyielding current. Now, imagine all of this from the point of view of their Spanish prisoner. Up until about four days ago, he'd had a pretty cushy life. He was a middling officer in a Spanish garrison that minted gold coins for the king. He had a house to himself. He had fresh beef. He had decent wine. 
he had men to order about, and the opportunity for just a little of that gold to fall into his pockets if he played his cards right. And then, for the past few months, he'd even had a young Kuna girl, royalty even, to visit whenever his shifts were over. He had to share her with some of the other officers, of course, but it still wasn't bad at all. And then those English dogs, those corsairs, had marched in and killed his men. They'd let the Kuna kill even more of them, and then they'd burned his home to the ground. And for the past two days, he'd been silently laughing at their incompetence behind the oar. They'd been lost, and they'd been struggling and cursing God himself. All the while, our Spaniard was tied up in their boat, feeling oh so superior to them. The one fellow, the bookish one who spoke a bit of Spanish, he wasn't so bad. He wasn't the typical sort for these scoundrels, but still. But then the young flood happened. Then water started rushing into the boat. So the Spaniard was cut free. He was handed a bucket and he was told to pitch water from the boat. For two hours he worked beside the English pirates. For two hours he forced his arms, which had been for days tied up in front of him, to scoop water. It was clear that this was his only way out of this situation, and perhaps even his own life depended on his working with these Englishmen, with these Lutheran corsairs. Do you think, when the young flood had ceased and they were safe, that he was tied up again? I mean, he probably was. They weren't friends now, but it must have been tough to bind the hands of a man who had just helped save your life. Now, I like to think that at least Ring Rose took the opportunity to thank him and maybe loosened the knots just a little bit. Now, after all was said and done, they rode to another island, just about a league off, which had ample space to land and make camp. Ring Rose said of that night, quote, It was from the loss of our company and the great dangers we were in, the sorrowfulest night that until then I had ever experienced in my whole life. For it rained impetuously all night long, insomuch that we were wet from head to foot and had not one dry thread about us. Neither through the violence of the rain were we able to keep any fire burning wherewith to warm or dry ourselves. We passed this heavy and tedious night without one minute of sleep, being all very sorrowful to see ourselves so far and remote from the rest of our companions, as also totally destitute of human comfort. For a vast sea surrounded us on one side, and the mighty power of our enemies, the Spaniards, on the other. End quote. Come the morning on April 19th, they put back into the water and made their way to Point San Lorenzo, and finally, after that, into the Gulf of San Miguel. At last they were out into the open ocean. They finally felt at home. They were freed from the confines of the river and her currents and hidden waterways. Almost immediately their canoe capsized. A wave smashed against the side and turned them all out into the water. The men swam for their lives, struggling for an island in the distance. The tide helped them ashore, and they all made it safely, but then their canoe washed ashore as well. But it was dashed against the rocks and rendered completely unusable. What must that have been like for Ringrose? Just a few short years ago, he'd been a well-to-do student, studying history and Latin and the classical works of the Western canon. Now he'd fallen in with a company of pirates. He'd aided in the taking of a Spanish fort, and for his sins, he was now washed up on a desolate island at the end of the world with no boat and little hope. All of their stores of bread and fresh water had been lost immediately. There was one stroke of luck. Their guns had been fastened securely to the boat. They were well-oiled and in waxed sackcloth, and then secured in a tightly-fitting box. They pulled them from the wreckage, and they began to tend to them. They were mostly unharmed. Their stores of powder and fuses and shot were also dry. And something happened then that the ring did not intend. The buccaneers spied a small sail in the distance, headed toward them. They had their guns out, and they readied them, but even at a distance it was clear this wasn't a Spanish craft. It was a Kuna canoe, not unlike the one they had just lost. And when it got closer, they could see that it was filled with, no, not Englishmen, but Kuna. They were there. They were coming to rescue them. Then the canoe that was sent to rescue Basil Ringrose, their Spanish officer, and their companions, it capsized in almost exactly the same place, 
but it was a superior craft. She dumped the men out, but she righted herself, and her single sail carried the canoe safely to shore. The pirates were elated. We might imagine that even their Spanish prisoner was filled with joy at the arrival of so many of his old enemies. Perhaps he was disheartened that it wasn't a Spanish craft, but he knew he had a way off the island. Bartholomew Sharp wrote of their plight, quote, One of our canoes being overset with men in her, but it pleased God that with extreme danger, even to those that rescued them, they were all saved. It being a certain truth that those who are born to be hanged shall never be drowned. End quote. He wrote those words after their voyage had ended, after some of their men had been hanged in the dockside at Port Royal. Others had their necks on the chopping block in London, but that's a story for another time. For now they were safe. After everything they'd been through, Basil Ringrose and his friends were on the ocean in a much better canoe with Kuna guides, and after their days of toil, they had a sail and wind to carry them to their companions. Night fell as they were making their way to a nearby island. A heavy rain began to fall, and it quickly grew so dark that they could see almost nothing. In the distance, though, they saw two points of light spring up on the shore. There were campfires, and the ship adjusted course to meet with their friends and comrades. One is forced to wonder when exactly they realized what was coming. As they approached, did they see that the camp was empty? Did Ringrose notice something was amiss? Did the Kuna? Apparently, Androius, who was among their rescuers, was calling out for his brothers as they neared the shore. Did the Spanish prisoner realize... Did he see the camp laid out on the shore and know what was afoot? If so, was he collected enough to keep his quiet? As soon as the boat made landfall, from the tree line, two score Spanish soldiers emerged. Even amidst that downpour, they wore armor and had muskets at the ready, all of them pointed at that tiny canoe. Six of them came forward to lay hands on the boat, but at just that moment, the Kuna jumped from the craft and ran for the tree line. The Spanish guns moved to follow them, but as soon as their feet hit the land, the Kuna were disappeared into the jungle. Ringrose and his companions grabbed for their guns, hoping to defend themselves, but just then the Spanish muskets swiveled back and they had over a dozen guns pointed at the four men. The Spanish pulled their craft further ashore, and the Spanish ordered the pirates from the boat and marched them to camp. They recognized the officer as a Spaniard and as a prisoner, and even if they didn't know him, they cut him free. Ringrose asked if any among the Spanish spoke any English, or perhaps a little French. They replied no. But their captain, who was apparently an educated man, spoke Latin quite well. Ringrose, with some relief, was able to communicate. He learned that some of these men had been captives of the other pirates who had gone on ahead. They'd been taken from Santa Maria, but then freed. The rest were a company of militiamen on patrol who had set a trap after learning of the Englishmen in the region. So the pirates were led to a hut with a fire burning inside. The pirates were forced down to their knees. Their hands were bound behind them and they were made to wait while their captain pulled Ringrose up and pushed him inside. Placed in the fire were all manner of implements. There were pokers and pincers and they were growing red with the heat. A blanket lay on the ground nearby, and on said blanket were daggers and shears and leather bindings. It was a rudimentary collection, but bindings and hot irons and blades. Ringrose knew that he was to be interrogated by the Spanish captain. He would suffer torture at this inquisition. He would give up all he knew of the English plans, and then he would die. Painfully. The captain cut his hemp bonds and laid him on the ground, and then, before he had a chance to reach for his irons or even to ask a question, in walked the haggard and weather-beaten prisoner Ringrose had sailed with on his voyage to this place. The two Spanish officers began to speak, and it quickly became heated. Ringrose only understood a little bit of Spanish, and he couldn't keep up. Their voices were tight, however, and they kept looking over in his direction. After a tense several minutes, the captain relented, and he bowed his head. They turned toward Ringrose, and 
In Latin, the captain explained to him what he and Ring Rose's former prisoner had discussed. Apparently, Ring Rose's prisoner outranked the captain. He had taken command of this militia force. They had indeed intended to torture the English rovers, but the captain interceded on his behalf. So, quote, the captain arose from his seat and embraced me, saying that we Englishmen were very friendly enemies and good people. Withal, he desired me to sit down by him and to eat. He told me that for the kindness I had showed, he gave us all our lives and liberties, which otherwise he would certainly have taken from us. Thus he bid me likewise take my canoe and go in God's name, saying withal, he wished us be as fortunate as we were generous. End quote. Now, the Spanish did invite the pirates to stay the night, but they thought it better to decline. The soldiers there in the camp, just as they had pulled the canoe ashore, well, once the pirates were in her, they pushed the canoe back to sea. Ringrose and his mates paddled along the shoreline until the Kuna, who had run from the encounter, came from the tree line and emerged to join them. They spent the night at sea, despite the shore being so nearby. They wanted to space between themselves and the Spanish, and the opportunity to run should the Spanish change their mind. When morning came, they roused and headed out to hopefully, finally, find their companions. But someone found them first. In the distance, they saw sails, not just a piragua or a canoe with a sail like their own, but a real ship. She had the wind, and the ship was making right for them. Down here, in the South Sea, it was virtually impossible that it could be any other, but as she approached, their fears were confirmed. Those were Spanish sails, and she had a Spanish hull. The men in the canoe rested their oars. There was no hope of outrunning this ship and no hope of escape. They were, after all of their troubles, resigned to their fate. The Spanish ship dropped sails and came in just a bit closer. But then they began to drop their colors. The Spanish cross was pulled down and another flag was raised in its place. It looked red with green and white. They put a boat into the water and it began to row over. Ringrose and his men, growing hopeful, they began to row over as well toward the boat. And as they approached the ship, they could make out those colors more clearly. It was a red banner adorned with green and white ribbons. It was the flag of Captain Bartholomew Sharp. Next time, we're going to look at the other half of today's journey. We'll follow Bartholomew Sharp and William Dampier and John Coxon and all the rest of them, and we'll discover exactly how they came to be in possession of a Spanish ship just in time to rescue Basil Ringrose. Before we go, though, a question. That bit at the end, with the Spanish soldiers on the beach, that trap laid for Ringrose and all of his companions. Well, first of all, I should mention that I told the story almost exactly as Ringrose did, though I did add a few flourishes of my own. I want to be clear that some of the details and emotions were my additions to that part of the story, but I feel justified in adding them. Because, do you believe any of that? I mean, Ring Rose wrote it down. He published the account, but it seems too spectacular to be true. All in one night, he was captured by the Spanish. He was declared too kind to be tortured by their enemies, and then he was set free by his Spanish captors who just happened to be friendly men. I mean, personally, I love the story, but I think it's just that. I think it's a story, a bit of color. I think he and his companions had been lost at sea for several days. They'd been thrown about by the current, and they'd been shipwrecked and nearly drowned. All the while, Captain Sharp and his men were having a fine time. They were winning prizes. I think, and this is just my opinion, but I think that Ringrose saw how pathetic his story was in comparison, and that young man who had been raised reading all of the classical Greek and Roman literature, all of those heroic deeds of great men, 
Well, I think he came up with just a little lie to the other pirates, and conveniently managed to remove the Kuna from the story so they couldn't contradict him. And then his companions, who were also a bit embarrassed, well, they joined in and backed him up. But then again, maybe it's all true. I'd like to thank everybody who has helped to support the show, everybody who has left us a rating or a review, everybody who has subscribed or liked on YouTube, everybody who has recommended the show to your friends or family, and everybody who has signed up to become a patron on Patreon. Without all of you, I wouldn't be able to do this. So thank you. Special thanks to our Patreon Commodore class, Kane, Kenway, Hefei, Jennings, Two-Gun Tony, Drunken Dak, Antonio, the Pirate Nopales, Matthew the Navigator, Bull, Vertigon, Conifalinde, Rumgut, and Bootstraps Bailey. For access to our many rewards, which include exclusive episodes, audiobook readings, and our thank you gifts such as the Pirate History Podcast map, t-shirt, and pin, go to patreon.com slash piratehistorypodcast. As always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.